found as Anisa Sarai. I probably have the most common North Indian first name, last name combination in the world. There are movies in which actresses are called that. So it was impossible for me to find my name on the internet. So that's how you can find it on the internet. Um, I'm a part-time typeface designer. And while a lot of people would think that's a really cool thing to do, for me it's not quite cool enough. And I like to think of myself as like a proper sort of nerd. People have asked me often what I really do for a living, and I don't quite do anything in particular. My life tends to be a series of side projects that I really love. So I thought there would be no better way to sort of introduce myself, but to run you through a few things that I do. Um, I run this sort of small archive of LED typefaces that you find in public transit. I call it type in transit and I basically, wherever I travel, I snap up pictures and then I do small critiques and analyses of how the typefaces work. Uh, in Delhi, I work with Kriti Mongra of Terminic Design. Maybe some of you have heard of her. And we run this thing called Type Conventions, where we build these large public lettering installations with volunteers. And their only purpose is for the people of the city to sort of come and enjoy. There's no other point to that. I love books, and I recently worked with this studio in Bangalore called Part 17 to make a book cataloging app for personal libraries because I had thousands of books and I could never keep track of them. Recently, I worked with a friend who's in the audience today uh, to design a translator between Indian languages and Braille. I'm also working on a documentary film about opening title sequences in Indian cinema. And on top of all of that, I have a food blog. <laughs> so that's basically what I do. And apart from all these exciting things, in the last couple of years, I went and got myself a master's degree. And this was a degree in typeface design at the University of Reading, which is in the UK. And I was super excited that a lot of people that Vivek mentioned in his presentation were from Reading. So, you know, the Arabic Helvetica, Frutiger, Univer, all done by alumni of the university. Lumen was done by an alumni. Ratna Ramanathan is from the University of Reading. Uh, so even though the university happens to be in England, there is a large amount of emphasis there on design in global scripts, especially scripts uh, that come from India, which was part of the reason why I went to study there. So after I finished my master's degree in typeface design, I moved to the US, and then I worked at Apple with the font team to basically work on the stuff that you see in OS X and iOS. So while I was at Apple, I worked on projects which involved designing typefaces for Devnagri, for Latin, for Europe and Africa, for Russia, for Greece, um, for Thailand, I think. So, like a large set of scripts. So, that is what I do. The reason why I'm here is to talk about the typeface that I designed while I was at Reading, and it's a typeface called Kanpur. Uh, Kanpur is a city in North India, that's where my parents are from, hence the name. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is basically the challenges which lie in front of anyone who wants to design typefaces in Indian scripts, and in general the challenges for Indian typography. And at the same time, because there are so many challenges, obviously there's a lot of opportunity to do some really interesting, exciting work. So, I'm going to talk about why I designed a typeface which was like Khan. Because at Reading we get to decide our own brief, so I decided what I wanted to make and then I had to learn how to make it. So why did I decide to design something like this? And then I'll give you a sense of what goes into designing a typeface of this scale. So I found out that I was going to Reading in early 2011. And even before I went to Reading, I knew I had to go and design a typeface there. So I started thinking about what the typeface could be like. And I had a pretty simple sense of what I wanted to do. It had to be a typeface that did justice to its content. So if you, I mean, all of you were seeing Vivek's presentation, and he said that, you know, you don't have typefaces for basic stuff. So if I want to read, you know, a textbook in Hindi, chances are it's going to be really badly designed. If I wanted to, I mean, actually, as a graphic designer, if, and I'm guessing some of you are, if you wanted to design 
complex brochure in the internet. What were you going to do? You probably not know how to design it well at all because you unfortunately simply can't. So if you look at a lot of typefaces that exist for all Indian scripts, a lot of them look really, really dated. That's because they were mostly designed in the 60s and we've been repurposing them ever since. The second thing is that they're broke. So, you know, to give you an example from the Ibnagri, you know, you basically have half letters. So if I'm saying the word kya, that is the half sound of ka and the full sound of ya. So a lot of times when a word like that shows up, there will be like ugly overlaps and things won't quite sit properly. And that happens for all Indian scripts, not just them. So a lot of them are just basically good. And then the last thing is that there are very few resources for good typography. I mean, when we think of Latin typefaces, we think of something with a regular and an italic and a bold and a bold italic and then a semi-bold and an italic with it and hopefully a light and then an ultra light and maybe a display and so on and so forth. So when you design something, you know, you actually have a good palette to begin with. That simply does not exist for Indian scripts. I mean, even at best, you're probably going to have like four or five weights, but you never quite have styles which you can use together. So I got to Reading and I was told that I couldn't just say that I want to design a typeface that does justice to this content. That wasn't sort of good enough for an academic setting. So I came up with a formula. So my brief was a Latin and Devanagari typeface family for bilingual dictionaries. Now, the idea was to somehow sneak in everything I wanted to do into this formula. So Latin is the script that we use for English, French, German, and <coughs> the ABC. Devanagari is what we use for Hindi and Marathi, in case someone doesn't know that. Um, <coughs> and when I said typeface family, I was very certain that I didn't want to design just one form had to be a large set of fonts that could all work together really well. <laughs> then it was a bilingual typeface, which meant that there were two scripts, and two scripts that looked really different. So they had to be harmonized in a way that they worked really well together. And the last bit was dictionaries, which gave me some sort of a brief in saying, you know, dictionaries are always have like really small text, and it's really dense. It's normally not printed very well. And there's pretty complex typography. So that gave me the chance to make something which has a lot of styles and things. So I started off with three problems that I wanted to solve. And so the first question I had to ask myself was, what would the Devanagri look like? And one of the things that I wanted to do very strongly was not to start with the Latin, because that's what always happens, right? Also in a lot of examples that we may show us. You have so many Latin typefaces, what most people end up doing is, there's a Helvetica and it works really well. Let's make something that looks like that. As opposed to saying, I need a good, you know, I don't know, Arabic typeface, and I will make it. You know, English is so sort of spread everywhere that it's hard to sort of get out of that. But since I could, I chose to start from the Devanagri and decide what that would look like and let that inform what the Latin must look like because, you know, I can do that. Um, so a lot of the answers for that came from the brief in terms of its functionality. For instance, it had to be legible in small sizes. So, you know, for something to be legible in small sizes, you have to ensure that all the white spaces in it are pretty large. Because if they're not, they're just going to get clogged up and you're going to have just a lot of black ink. So, you know, the design had large counters, it had a lot of square shapes to make sure it was legible in small sizes. Then it had to be really sort of sturdy and robust because, again, small sizes, bad printing, you don't want your letters to not get printed properly. So, you know, contrast between the thick parts and the thin parts of the letter was very less so that the thin parts don't just disappear in small sizes. Now, beyond these sort of functional choices, there were a lot of aesthetic choices, which basically led to it not looking dated. So, while I did not want it to look dated, I still wanted to sort of you know, give a nod to a really, really long calligraphic tradition that the typeface has. So if you see the font, it has the correct pen angle based on calligraphy. So normally, I don't know, has anyone done any sort of English calligraphy ever? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so if you've done that, in Devanagri, the pen angle is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not do something bizarre where I choose the, you know, English pen angle and make all the Devanagri. I wanted to 
be respectful and use what they use in their country for like hundreds of years now. The second thing I wanted to do was to have really fluid forms. Because calligraphy, especially for the Devanagari, can be, if you're doing it with the right kind of pen, quite sort of strict and rigid. So have a lot of fluid forms which might make it look a little bit more friendly. And then I took that a step further to say that, you know, not have any sort of sharp terminals, have a lot of sort of round, soft shapes to make the typeface look more contemporary and more, you know, approachable in some ways. So once I had a little bit of that done, the next question was, you know, but now I don't have a Latin and it has to sort of work with it. The one thing I really did not want to do was to sort of create some, some kind of kind of style monster. You know, like stick seraphs on my letters, you know, or do something equally strange to the Latin. So you know, if you don't do that, what do you do? Because the scripts look extremely, extremely different. So the first thing I did was to match the metrics. By which I mean, if you put both the Latin and the Devanagari in the same line, it doesn't look like one of them is visually larger than the other. Because if you've seen a lot of bilingual books in India, they basically use like Times New Roman to set the English text. And there will be some Indian font in this superbly tiny size. And you know, you can see it was an afterthought. So I really did not want that to happen. So the idea was to match them up in such a way that in a sentence, if they're used together, they have the same sort of presence on the page. The next thing was that because they're so different in shape, if, so, okay, so typographically color doesn't mean red, blue, or green. It basically means that if you sort of squint your eyes and look at it, like a piece of paper with text printed on it, how black or gray does it look to you? So when you're designing two scripts that are this different, when they're used together, you want both of them to look like regular, right? You don't want one to be so much darker than the other that, you know, I don't know, the Latin looks like a regular, but the Devanagari sort of looks like a fold. Because then that won't work. So because Devanagari has that horizontal line on top of every single letter, if you keep the stem width the same, Devanagari looks really, really dark. So you have to do some sort of adjustment to make sure that both scripts have the same color on the page. And then the next thing was to put, you know, similar features wherever you could put them, and not force it too much. So the inner counters of letters in both scripts have corners. So that's the kind of feature that both scripts can have without it feeling like it's been you know, forced down its throat. So with this, I got a sense of what the typeface would be visually. But there was a bigger question of, you know, is the typeface workable? Can people actually type out the text and get what they want to do. So there's this brilliant magical thing called Opal Type, which is a little bit of programming that typeface designers do, which I'm guessing a lot of people know of. The simplest example of this is when you type F and I, most fonts will convert it into an FI ligature, so that the little dot on top of the I doesn't go clashing with the thing coming down on the F. And most typefaces do this, and most of us don't know. And that's the way it's supposed to be. The idea is that no one notices things like that. So for something like English, the things it does are usually pretty ornamental. You know, if there was no FI ligature, you'd still be able to read F and I. It might not look as pretty. But for Indian scripts, because they are complex, and they usually have the whole system of having a consonant and then vowels attaching to it, Without open type, you basically can't write anything. So if any of you has ever used like a, lo a localized keyboard, you will know that you know even to write the simplest words, you key in like a whole bunch of stuff. And if it wasn't for open type, you would basically just get the first part of that equation without the plus signs, which is not what you want. You basically want all the rearrangement, all the correct shapes to you know magically end up on your screen. So that is done using open type. And so the typeface I design actually has an extensive amount of open type to make things work. So for instance, if you have the k, and the thing after that is the e mantra, and that's the standard e mantra, except k is a wider letter. So using open type, I can ensure that it gets replaced by an e mantra which looks perfect for that letter. Similarly, the letter h, 
with the U matra at the bottom, it basically doesn't look like it's in the center, and it sort of looks like it's clashing. So I can use open type to replace that combination with a ligature, which makes it look right. So to make a typeface which works with open type, you usually require between 600 to 800 cubes per bit. So the regular will have these many, and then multiply that with whatever else you decide to draw. So that's an approximate that we have, like a font like Adobe Devanagari, which is probably one of the more extensive fonts, probably has about 1200 clips per bit, because it supports, you know, all sorts of obscure Sanskrit words, which most fonts do. So, like a lot of Indian type foundry stuff that Vivek showed us probably has around 600, 650 clips per font. What's a clip? Sorry? What's a clip? Um, so the curve was a glyph, the E mantra was a glyph, the full stop is a glyph. So every character that you see in a font is basically called a glyph because it's possible that for every letter you need you need alternates. Like just like, like if you go here, the E mantra is one letter, but it might need several alternates. So they're all called clips. So there will be like E1 which will be then E2 which will be another clip, and E3 will be another clip. So yeah. So even though Devanagari as a basic character set has had about 50, 60 letters, to make all the combinations work properly, you design something which is around 600. Puja, can you speak into the mic? Should I? Okay. Just turn it towards this on the cord. So yeah, around 600 to 800 glyphs per weight. But then there's more stuff that you can do with open type, which can make the typeface work even better. So, which was things like the font having two kinds of routine symbols. One which works really well when you're writing in English text, one which works really well when you're writing in Devanagari text. I mean, these things are for all purposes, just niceties. But the thing is that, you know, it's my language that I'm writing in. I would want it to be nice. You know, it's the little things which we don't notice in Latin typography, and because they're missing in Indian script, they sort of stand out. And then things like, so, full vowel letters in Indian languages basically don't get used in the middle of words. They're always used at the beginning of a word. So a lot of them have very flourishy shapes. So if you look at the first one, it has this sort of tall white thing going in front, but we use a lot of English in our Indian languages. So the moment you transliterate you know, English words in Hindi, you have a lot of vowels which need to come in. For instance, I had a teacher and her name was Fiona. If I have to write Fiona in Hindi, the vowel O will be in the middle of a word. So the font has alternates that can be used inside transliterated words, which make you know, the text look better. Then things like tabular numbers. Most English fonts are going to come with multiple sets of numbers, and one of these is going to be a set where the widths of all the numbers are same. So if you are setting an annual report, you know, all your numbers will always line up. But no one does that for Indian fonts. I mean, who cares? So the idea was to have all those nice things even for Indian fonts. So if someone wants their annual report in Hindi, you know, they can actually have a proper table. Then, you know, more number styles. What if you wanted to do signage with it? Or you wanted to use it in a textbook? Um, arrows which match the number styles, which was extremely useful in something like a dictionary. So yeah, so with this, I basically had one weight <coughs> of the Devanagri with a lot of nice things going for it. But the trouble was it was just one weight, and I started off with believing there was going to be more. So the first thing that happened was to add weights. 
So we currently have to light a regular semi gold and a gold with the possibility of having stuff in the middle if it needs to. Um, then there was an attempt to make something which was like a sand serif, except there are no serifs to chop off. So it was basically a version which was not as soft as, and friendly as the original, but something with more sharp edges, something with slightly less contrast. And then that got a bold. And the bold in that had even more exaggerated features. So this would be the kind of thing that you would use you know, for a magazine headline, and then you would use a regular to set your text, and maybe you could use the semi-bold you know, for your pull quote, and you could use the sans serif regular for your captions, and actually have enough going around that you can design an actual document with it. Then this was probably the most exciting part of the project for me, which was saying, what if we could have a Devanagari attack? Like, what would that really look like? And there's this solution, which is slant the letters, squish them a little. But if you study design, you're told quite strictly never to do that with a font. Like, never, ever to do that with a font. So if I don't do that, how would I make a Devanagari italic? It clearly has absolutely no tradition for one. So it's not like I can go back, look at some manuscript from 300 years ago and go like, there. I'm going to draw No, that. but uh, a lot of people write like that. Precisely. When we were, yeah. So, yeah. So the idea was to learn from handwriting because even the italic that we see in English basically developed from a fast writing style. That is why it became narrower. Because if you go home and write yourself, you will realize if you are writing faster, your handwriting becomes narrow. When you're writing fast, it automatically slumps. It's not that the italics came out of nowhere. So the idea was to look at a lot of people's handwriting and see what makes handwriting different from conscious writing and try and get those features into this weight which I could call a Devanagari italic. So there were basically three features. One, you're writing fast. And because you're writing fast, you're not lifting your pen as many times. So you know, when people sort of make the bar on their T's when they're writing, they usually just put sort of like this one floating bar at the end of the word. Or you know, one single bar will basically be used for all the T's in that word. People don't lift their pens. The same thing happens in Hindi. People don't lift their pens. And then because they're not lifting their pens, they're going to retrace shapes. So if you draw a B, you basically do that, and then you retrace the stem, and then you make the rest of the B. But what is the purpose of developing an italic for the next I have a foreign word in my text, and I want to make sure it looks like it's not a Hindi word. I mean, the same reason as Latin, right? Because texts are complex, and you need different kinds of styles to be able to differentiate between them. But that's not native to no. the way you write. It's the way you write is quite native, right? I mean, slanting it is not native, but mm -hmm. our handwriting is native. usage of italics to emphasize something for it, it isn't native as a concept. It isn't, but the fact is that because of the fact that, you know, so many people came to our country and decided to stay here for so long, our texts are now really complex. And it would be naive to think that we can use just one style to set our texts. Like, you know, there are books in Hindi and they need bibliographies. And if you look at an English book, there's a pretty standard way of how you set a bibliography. You know, you put the names, you put the last name of the author in small caps. You know, you would put the name of the publication in italics, and so on. So that when someone is looking at a bibliography, they can quickly tell what is a book name. What do people do when they set bibliographies in Hindi? They basically don't know what to do. They just put everything in the regular, which only makes it harder for someone to read. Or, you know, if you look at things like, Mm. Recipe books, for instance. And if you look at a good recipe book in English, you will see so many different styles being used to show, you know, nice sort of tables which will tell you ingredients and measurements, big type for the title. If there's a sauce whose name is originally French, it could be set in italics. What do you do if you have to set something in Hindi? You basically take your one weight and sort of type everything out and hope you don't make any spelling errors. So I mean, the idea is to make, like I said in the beginning, something that justifies content. The fact is that our content is not the same as it used to be. So yeah, faster speed, fewer pen lifts, and retracing shapes. And that is what it ended up looking like. So wherever possible, the pen was not lifted. 
So if you were going to make a double Noah, which is the first character you see, I did it exactly like someone would write it by hand. Just do the whole thing in one go. You know, attaching vowel signs to characters. When you're writing, you normally don't pick up your pen and then go back and add it. You just do it you know, in a single stroke. So this basically became, I didn't call it an italic in the end because it's not Trinity. And that would have been a little misinformed. So it's basically a cursive because that's what you know handwriting is ultimately, some form of cursive. So yeah, so this was the font. And I can probably show you some examples of it in use. In, for instance, a dictionary. I have a question. Uh, is it possible to me <laughs> when you are trying to write this in AI Alex, that because of similarities in different scripts in India, <laughs> one script might look similar to the other and get confused? Yeah, so I'm guessing, see, Devnagri looks sort of like Gujarati, but Gujarati doesn't have a headline. So I suppose that's quite simple. Once you don't have a headline, it will look quite different. It sort of also looks like um, Gurmukhi, but Gurmukhi doesn't have a calligraphic tradition, so it's always monodinic. So this is basically for Devanagari. But I'm sure there could be a person for pretty much any script. Right? Because the way we see things written on, let's say, a signboard is very different from how we would write a note to someone. We write them fast, and it's usually sort of legible. Which is what handwriting is. Right. And the idea of making a cursive typeface would be to pick out features which can be repeated enough that it remains legible. Because you won't want a typeface to be legible. I have another question. Is the cursive face which you have developed, how is it the same family as the other typeface you developed? I mean, it could be a different... Same as, I don't know. I can give you examples of other... Okay. If you look at these two, you'd notice that their skeleton and metrics are the same. Right. So in that sense, if they're used together, they will have an inherent sense of similarity between them. I think with the weights, it's quite simple. I mean, it is really the same shape becoming factor. Even if you look at the cursive, you'll see features which are repeated. For instance, the little corner in the inner counter of the curve, which is the second character that you see. I mean, the idea of a typeface family is to have things which kind of look similar. So if you look at Georgia and Georgia Italic, they're not identical in any way or sort. They just have some features which lend them a sense of familiarity to each other. That's about it. But yeah, I mean, whether or not the Devnagri cursive fits with it is a question I've been asking myself. And I'd love to hear what everyone thinks about it as well. So yeah, this is it in the dictionary. I think the one on the left is uh, Devnagri, the uh, Hindi dictionary, the one on the right is as by English words. Then, you know, you can use them together sort of, since the cursive doesn't really have a tradition, you could use it as a display. There's no one to really stop you from doing that. So the idea was that if there are so many styles and if they are given out to graphic designers, who knows how they will use them? There's, you know, they might use something in a way that I don't expect. So if you look at the little text on the right, which if someone reads Devnagri reads tomato, tomato, potato, potato, uh, actually puts the words tomato and potato in the cursive like you would put foreign words in italics. Um, on the one on the left, it just uses it for heading, because it looks different. Like this I particularly like, especially the thing on the left, which is a train timetable. So this was like a chance to actually use the Devnagri numbers in a good tabular format. Also to use, you know, numbers with different styles to be able to differentiate train numbers. Having sort of these resources would make this document so much easier to parse than just having, you know, one style in which you So, yeah, that's that. So did you actually develop a tabular structure for your cursive numbers? Mm -hmm. How? I mean, it just what? has to be the same width. Yeah, so your numbers... Some letters will be narrower. I mean, even in sort of, the sort of case you see here, the letter on the bottom, I mean, by design, 
it's a slightly wider letter. And, you know, so you, just you just want to squish it a little. There's, there's really no other way. It's like how you write math in, when you're little, right? In the square grid things. Wider numbers have to be squished. The one sort of looks lonely in the box. That's just the way it is. extremely sort of purchasable even for us in the third world countries because font lab is quite expensive it's about 900 dollars I think. so yeah. so how do you create this font do you make it an illustrator import it, no, no, it um, font it all of these are basically vector based i mean these are all vectors so the only thing something like font lab I mean, glyphs or font forge will let you do is make vectors and then do things like you know uh, what's it called in Illustrator, clipping mask. It let you do things like clipping mask and make compound parts. But that's all you can do in that. Uh, what are options you have given for tracking between the letters? I mean, do you have any certain special option for you know, providing tracking? You know, what all uh, kerning also? So yeah, the letters are first spaced with the hope that a majority of them will work well. And then there's kerning pairs to make sure certain pairs, you know, okay. work better. The, the heavier uh, weights will always have tighter spacing because the white spaces inside them are really small, so the spaces between them tend to be small. The light ones will have more spacing. But I'm not sure what you mean by like more tracking options. One question about designing typefaces in general, uh, especially when it comes to italics and cursive writing. When you're designing for cursive, uh, a letter has a beginning and a letter has an ending. So in cursive, I believe the, letter, the beginning and the ending of two letters should join. Make it so is this the place where uh, these many glyphs come into picture? Mm -hmm. A lot of times they do because, you know, to give an example of Latin, it's possible that when you're making a cursive R, it joins in a certain way with letters like A, Q, and D because they all have the ground thing in the middle, but it might have to join very differently with an I, then you will need three kinds of R's and you will write some open type to say that every time an R comes before an I, put this one. But if it comes before an S, go fetch the other one and put it there. So you have to define all these combinations? You have to, yeah, to draw them and then define them in code to say which one comes before and after which one. So, so the first part that's in the one? Yes. How long will it take? Well, it's not finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started in November of 2011, and I had to make my university submission in June 1st, 2012. So, yeah, but it's, it's far from finished. Like, if I had to finish it and sell it, it would probably require about eight to nine months of my time, all day, every day. No fun side projects. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this thing? Uh, what, are the, what, what else are you uh, going to build into this? Sorry? What else are you going to build into it? Um, at this point, hopefully, add a few more weights, add all sorts of regional variants based on preferences of people. So like there are certain letters which the Marathi people like draw in a certain way, but the people who speak in Hindi like them another way, and the people who speak Nepali like them another way. So it will not be just adding those letters, but you know, adding all those alternates for those letters as well. So hopefully that, and I really want to have an Arabic which matches with the Latin and the Devnati. That's 
So, uh, can you, I'm just hypothetically speaking, can you make a font design open source? Yeah, this is set in an open source design. Source Sans Pro. Right. So, you're saying it takes so much time for you to make this font, right? Can you get someone else to do bits and pieces of that, it? That, that tends to happen very often in large font projects. So, right. if you have, like, you know, let me try to think of an example. Have you guys on the internet seen the typeface Scholar? S K O L A R. Yes. Scholar. I mean, it's everywhere on the web. So Scholar also started as something someone made at Ready. And so when the typeface got released, he basically only released the Latin portion, which he had drawn himself. Then he got in touch with someone who was really good at Greek, and they drew the basic Greek. And then he hired a couple of more people who finished the Greek by drawing the bold and the light. And then he hired someone for the Cyrillic, and then someone else made the Devanagari. And then someone else made the Gujarati. So yeah, a lot of times there's more than one person who ends up at least finishing the typeface. Because I suppose it would take maybe one or maybe two people to come up with the core concept of the typeface. But then after that, additions are often made by other people. One of my frequent interactions with font is when choosing the font in Word or mm -hmm. such document. So how do such fonts get chosen? Who decides, okay, these are the fonts that um, need to be there? So Microsoft actually commissioned a set of fonts many years ago by this gentleman called Matthew Carter. He's the dude who's designed Georgia over Diana, basic snare round hand. I mean, it's said that he's the most red person in the world <laughs> because his fonts are red the most. <laughs> as opposed to being an author. So they actually commissioned a set of things, so which make the core fonts. Recently, Microsoft did a new set, which was all those fonts that start with the letter C, Corvel, Calibri, whatever, which was also like a group effort. A lot of people work together to design that. And the rest, they basically buy off people. I think the latest one is called Zigo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So either you commission it or you sort of buy it. So for instance, on the iPad, in the new iBook, for instance, you can choose a bunch of fonts, right, in which you can read the books. There's like probably four or five options. So none of them is a font that Apple commissioned. They were existing fonts that people had made and were selling, and Apple rented them and bought a license. So, yeah, mostly they're licensed designs. So yeah, you could design a text if they could like it, and then it would be on board everywhere. And you'd probably make a lot of money. <laughs> Did you mean that? No, I mean, what is the process? Do they look for more usage or good design or everything? I was asking what is the criteria for your form to get selected and such? Yeah, something like that. I just want to know, but if I tell you, I'm kidding. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> more like Apple would come and kill both of us. <laughs> It's, it's basically uh, what fonts are more available, like initial version of uh, Windows. I mean, basically they go out and they look at stuff which they think would be useful. So if you look at Microsoft, you see they have a whole bunch of fonts. There's formal fonts which you might use for a document. There is some fonts which look like you might use on a wedding invitation. There's other fonts which look like you would use on your you know, daughter's birthday party. They basically think of basic uses a desktop user would have, and then try and put something which might be useful to them. They also, I think, have a black letter, which is a little disturbing. I don't know who uses them anymore. But <laughs> there was famous Comic Sans. Uh, which uh, also, by the way, designed by an alumni of University of Reading. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I have a question. Uh, so when designing these fonts, do you keep in mind where they're going to be read? Because, uh, for example, if you have to design something for an iPad mm -hmm. and design something for a desktop or for a holding, Right? Yeah, you would think differently. Yeah, so do you have to customize your fonts to each of these devices or like, final have, mediums? I mean, I don't know, how many of you use InDesign or have used InDesign? Right. And there's a typeface called Minion Pro, right? Yes. Okay. Minion Pro has a different design for about a dozen sizes. And you don't even know, it just replaces it. So if, you, if you're typing in Minion Pro in six point, 
it looks different from if you're typing in Minion Pro and Drop Point. The font has been designed for all those sizes separately, bundled into this one font, and Adobe secretly changes it and you never realize it. <laughs> That's a lot like icon design, right? Exactly, it's a lot like icon design. Precisely, yeah. It all depends on what scale you have to use it in. Yes. So, so when you designed this... Um, I did not do any kind of magic like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you have to design separate glyphs for clear type versus non-clear type? No, all of this goes on top of this. You can choose to hint it separately, but it all happens on the same outlines. So if you're designing specifically for the screen and for a particular hinting environment, you might choose certain shapes over others because they can so your, your font design itself would might change it. Might change it. Like the reason why Georgia looks very good is because Matthew Carter was told, this is the screen people are going to look at it on, so go figure. So he made sure it looks good, on better on Microsoft machines than on OS templates because it was designed with that in mind. What are the opportunities for the Indian type types that you developed in terms of they being adopted or? Well, First, I should finish it. And then, yeah, there's, there's the Indian type foundry that um, Drake mentioned. There is a foundry called Rosetta, which does a lot of word scripts. And you spell it? Rosetta is in the Rosetta store. R O S E W T. They have fonts in a lot of scripts. They have like Arabic, Syriac. They also have Indian scripts. So. No, but are people buying it for commission? Because it takes a lot of time, right? Unfortunate, but yeah, a lot of people do. Like, I recently did some work for uh, Fanta, for instance, who wanted to localize their uh, tagline. I think it's something quite lame, actually. Uh, for hot, for more fun, more two other words. I can't remember what it was. More taste, more fun, and one more thing, which was more. And they basically wanted that first translated into it. Someone did that, so it became Zada taste, Zada Maza. <laughs> but then they needed a font which matched the font in which they put the tagline in English, much like the IKEA thing. And so, you know, that needed to be developed so Fanta could sell more Fanta, I suppose. So that sort of stuff happens all the time. You know, that mostly because of business, because when they come to countries like ours, in Vodafone, for instance, when they came, they had to commission typefaces in all major Indian languages. Silly question, but we have localized newspapers all over the country, and they all use the same. You know, the fonts I mentioned which were developed in the 60s. They're using because the P5-year-old fonts. Basically. Yeah, because the trouble is that they all also have a very strict production system, mm -hmm. and a lot of those production systems are not even calibrated to accept open type. Okay. So they basically use the linotype machines. I don't know if you've heard. Awesome printing machines. So yeah, so they just use the fonts that they were that were being used then. So I mean, new stuff happens, but it's slow. I like Linotype has like ninety percent market share, and something like that. Sure. It's actually a really good movie, which might be worth seeing on one of the designs. They have a really nice hour-long documentary about. What is the name? About Linotype. Yeah. It's pretty stellar film. What is the name? Last one. Uh, we're currently building a. A mobile application and going through this exercise on picking a color which basically represents certain attributes and therefore it kind of syncs up with the whole user experience. I'm assuming there must be a similar exercise with fonts. Mm -hmm. uh, could you point me to, so we don't have any resident experts on, on this front, but any, is there any way to pick out a certain font given the context of our application and what are the problems we are trying to solve? You just have to be really sensitive and look. No. So, so the problem is actually that's how we're doing it now, but we're not experts. I mean, it's all our gut feeling that this looks good and I think this will achieve our business objective. So our approach to design is that, you know, we are trying to solve very specific business problems mm -hmm. in the mobile phone context and things of that nature. So color is simpler to the extent that there is enough information. Color is both simple and hard. So is typefaces because colors have very particular meanings in very particular contexts. Yeah. And the moment that context changes, even a little bit, the meaning of a color, you know, becomes sort of, you know, sort of red. Bright might wear red in some parts of the country, but at the same time, red is violet. 
and our brains are very sensitive about reading color based on what situation there is. So when you see a bride in red, you don't get scared of her. But if you see, you know, red on a signboard, you get scared. When you walk into McDonald's, which is all red, you don't think of it as either a bride or as something in juice. So it's all quite malleable. Actually, in the context of I think what you want to be around. Yeah, sure. So we'll take a quick 10 minute break and then we'll come back and do the jam on type of it. Yeah? Thank you guys. Thanks a lot, Kiva.